We didn't talk about me introducing you. <laughs> Here's Kusala. Yay, he likes cats. Okay. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs> Well, happy holidays to everybody. And I wanted to share the Buddhist holiday with you today and why we have one. It uh, happened in 1873 that in the Mahayana Zen tradition, they decided to go from the lunar calendar to the solar calendar. And lo and behold, we have Bodhi Day on December 8th. So Buddhists get to celebrate too. But what is Bodhi Day and what does it mean to a Buddhist or what would it mean to you not being a Buddhist? Well, Bodhi Day is the day that the Buddha became enlightened underneath the Bodhi tree. And as you probably know the story, he left his family at 29 to seek his perfection. And at the age of 35, he succeeded. 36 years, pardon me six years and then he sat underneath the Bodhi tree for seven days it said in some traditions I like seven and on the seventh day he calmed down and something remarkable happened he began his journey to Nirvana and it said there were three watches of the night and the Christian tradition has watches of the night, and the Jewish tradition has watches of the night. And these are segments, these are periods of time that happen all night and all day, and it's broken down. And it said, in the first watch of the night, as the Buddha sat beneath the Bodhi tree, he became aware of all his past lives and how he had lived them, and how he had exited from them, and entered the new one, up to 100,000 past lifetimes. Now, people have asked me, well, can you remember your past life? Is there any recording of all the lives you've already lived? And in the Theravada tradition, the early Buddhist tradition, yes, it's in the Bhavanga consciousness. And in the Mahayana tradition, it is in the storehouse consciousness. And these are little seeds of the past lives, but we don't have access to them because we're not enlightened. But once you become enlightened, you get the code. <laughs> and you're able to see all the past lives you've lived and how skillful or unskillful you've been. So can you imagine sitting down and spending a couple hours just going through all your past lives? And what you have come to understand is this is finally your last one. You'll never have to be reborn again. Now, it doesn't mean you don't exist. It means that you just won't be born. And birth is oftentimes looked at as a, a wonderful thing, a celebration, announcements are made, parties are given. Everybody's having a really good time. And there's this little guy or gal who now will be suffering their whole life. <laughs> and you sort of wonder, why are you having a party? <laughs> you know, so the, I think the party really begins when you finally ended all those births and past lives in Nirvana. I got an email just the other day from a guy, Facebook friend. He says, you know, I want to change my life. I'm getting tired of being in relationship. I haven't ever had a good one. They've always ended in terrible ways. And I just want to be alone now. I want to live my aloneness. And I want to be happy. And I don't want to be drawn into any more relationships. Can you recommend something to me? And I wrote back and I said, Nirvana. <laughs> <You'll>, <laughs> it is simple, exactly. So I haven't had heard a response yet. Hopefully he understood the humor behind it as well. 
So now the Buddha goes into the second watch of the night. And it said in this watch, he was able to see how all things have been reborn. The animals, the humans, the devas, the angels, how they were reborn. And, and what was the cause of their rebirth? And as it turns out, the cause of their rebirth was their karma. Karma is what pushes a Buddhist or other into the next lifetime. It gets filled with the karma of past lifetimes. And that's where you start. And then your life is, how do I change my karma if it's bad? Or how do I keep my karma if it's good? What do I need to do? What do I need to avoid? But he went into great detail about what he understood about karma. And karma is everything we think, we say, and we do. And it creates an energy, if you will, that in the world it's filled with a bunch of neutral energy. And as soon as we start thinking and speaking and acting, we transform that energy either in a skillful way or an unskillful way. And it follows us through our entire life until we get to be reborn again and start one more time. But the thing about karma, which I really like, is we're in charge. It is something we can do right now to change our life. So if you're having a bad day, people are cutting you off on the freeway, maybe what you need to do is think a little more skillfully. Kindness and compassion. Speak a little more skillfully. Kindness and compassion. Act a little more skillfully. Kindness and compassion. That will change your day right now. And you're in charge, depending on how much kindness and compassion you can generate in your life. And th this is the time of year when it's really encouraged to be kind and compassionate, to be giving, to share. And it's difficult, I find, to share because sometimes I get attached to stuff. And, and I don't want to share. I just want to keep it. You know, it's like that, that box of chocolate-covered cherries that your aunt gave you. You know, and it's been on the shelf now for about a year, but it still tastes wonderful. And sometimes you just don't want to share them. You just want to eat the whole thing. So this is really good practice for us this time of year to be generous, to share the wealth. And even if you don't have much wealth, you can share your time. And time, as you get older, is the most valuable thing you have. So now we have karma, and the Buddha looked out onto the world, and he saw how all things arose, existed, and passed away. And karma was the main influence on that existence and passing away. And now we get into the third watch of the night, which is the most incredible part of the story. So he's sitting there. He's just viewed 100,000 past lifetimes. He's just viewed how everything else came to arise. And now he sees that everything is conditional. Now, when you hear those words, it's not going to make you run out and yell in the world, everything is conditional. But what he saw was this. There are 12 links. And this is sort of a technical Buddhist philosophical model, which I will not go into at this time because I don't want to bore you with that. <laughs> but let me say this. We have 12 links. It's a big circle. There's no beginning and there's no end. Our freedom is found in breaking one of the links. If we can break the link, we can achieve nirvana, freedom, the end of suffering. But more importantly for me, when I read this model, the Buddha came to understand that there was no first cause. Wow! I said to myself, no first cause. Nothing ever started. It just keeps going on and on and on. World systems come into being, then they disappear. 
Humans come into being and they disappear. Cats come into being and they disappear. And it's just because everything is conditional and everything has a cause and nothing stands independent of the cause. But there was no first cause. And people want to know, how did it all start? You had fires up here. How did it start? We have very wise and intelligent people rummaging through the forest trying to find out how it started. And then you feel so much better when you find out, oh, that's how it started. Well, maybe we can prevent it next time because now we know how it started. But how did the world start? And very intelligent and wise people have spent their whole life trying to figure out how it all started and they ended in failure. Can you imagine spending your whole life and not having an adequate answer at the end of it? And just having to let it all go and wait for the next rebirth? Wow. So sometimes it's better to just say, I don't know. I don't know how it started. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. But if I look carefully, I'll get some clues and I'll continue and hopefully I'll be skillful and I'll suffer less and everybody else will suffer less as well. Now, no first cause led him to understand there is no one here speaking. Which is sort of disappointing. <laughs> because when I woke up today, I said, I'm somebody. And I got something to do. And I'm going to do it. And now I'm doing it. And now, rather than being somebody, I'm just talking about stuff. Where do I live? Where is the true nature of me? Where is the essence? What is it, that one thing that stands independent and is unique and no one has one like it? I'm the only one. What is that thing? And the Buddha said, there wasn't one. He said, we're just a process. We, had, we were lucky enough to be born a human being. We have a mind and a body. And because those two things are working together, we have the illusion of being separate and somebody, which helps us exist in this very complicated world. Because we have to think independently and apart from stuff in order to use it or avoid it. So here I stand speaking about Bodhi Day, and I look at the door, and I become one with the door, no longer separate. It's a rather interesting feeling, but you know what? I'll never get to leave. <laughs> yeah. Because I can't use the door. The door is me. I'm the door. So once I'm separate from the door, I can use it. It can be an exit or an entrance. So I have to be separate from everything in my life in order to understand it, in order to use it, and what that separateness does at a very subtle and not so subtle level is it causes me to suffer. Because I'm always apart. There's always this bit of loneliness connected, or at least aloneness connected to being separate. And sometimes deep in meditation, or sometimes singing a song, we lose that separateness for a few moments and the universe embraces us again and it feels so good and we wish we could live there but we can't because it's too complicated we have to understand too many things in order to simply exist and so we become separate again but we have those moments and we know the true nature of our life is interconnectedness and interdependence with everything, which should give us a really good feeling. We're connected to everything, 
even Santa Claus. <laughs> and yet it doesn't feel that way. We've sort of lost the ability to go there unless we sit quietly for a few hours and reflect on breath or wise thoughts or a candle or meditation CD, something to get us, <laughs> something to get us there, something to get us there. Wow. So the Buddha on the third watch of the night, he said, I have discovered that everything is ultimately unsatisfactory because we have to be separate. I've come to understand that everything is always changing constantly. Nothing stays the same longer than a moment. And that causes us to be uncomfortable because we want certain things in our life to last. And we want the bad things in our life to change even faster than they are. And we're sort of always disappointed because they have their own time frame and they'll change when they want to, no matter what we do or don't do. So this leads to the unsatisfactoriness that the Buddha talked about in waking up to the fact that we are interconnected and interdependent and are only one of the contributing factors in our life. Just one. All the contributing factors that went into getting me here today would be far too many to even think about. That to me, it was I got in my car and I drove here and there wasn't much traffic because it's a holiday and everybody left and this is the best time to be in California when everybody <laughs> leaves. <laughs> but that's the simple observation that I made with the 10,000 things necessary for me to get here today. And the 10,000 things that I have to go through every day to make a day happen. Wow, I'm exhausted. <laughs> and then he talked about we're not who we think we are. We are an illusion. We can, and because of that, we can be anybody we want to be. We're not stuck. We're not encased in cement. Who do you want to be today? You can be that today. I posted something about Santa Claus on my Facebook page. It's a man's life. A man starts out believing in Santa Claus. And then, as a man matures, he doesn't believe in Santa Claus any longer. And then as he gets older, he is Santa Claus. <laughs> it's that wonderful journey that we're all going through. How lucky are we to be able to change anything we think, say, and do? We have that ability once we figure out how to do it, and once we figure out who we aren't, not who we are, we have that ability. So now in the third watch of the night, it's almost over, and the sun is starting to rise, and the Buddha has achieved his nirvana, his liberation, his freedom. He'll never have to suffer again. He'll never have to be reborn again. He'll never have karma again. What a magical moment that must have been. But he was alone, and he needed to have a witness, a witness to see that he had achieved the final goal, that he had reached his perfection as a human being. And he said, ah, I do have a witness. And his hands went to the earth and touched the earth. So this earth that we are now living on was the witness to his liberation, his final moments as an ordinary person, Siddhartha, and an extraordinary person, the Buddha. And oftentimes you'll find a Buddha statue with him in the earth pose, touching the earth with his right hand. That's the witness, that's the day, the morning he achieved his full perfection. What a great story, I thought to myself. This is fantastic. And because I'm human, I have that option as well. I can do the same darn thing. 
except I live in L.A. <laughs> and we have helicopters, we have sirens. They just changed the road in front of the Zendo. They tore it up one day and laid it the next. Whoa. Always rumblings going on in the big city, the urban environment. No peace, no solitude, no Bodhi trees that I can find. So people say, well, you know, how do you feel about that? I said, well, it's like a city parish to me. You know, it's a good place for a Buddhist to be because that's where everybody is suffering. Downtown L.A. <laughs> we need to be there. Even if we have to postpone our own liberation, our own happiness, our own freedom, somebody needs to be there, not necessarily to do anything, but just simply to listen and be their witness. Be their witness. And they'll come and talk to you, and they'll tell you exactly what's wrong, and they'll ask you, what should I do? And then you'll say nirvana. <laughs> And then for the next 20 years, they go to study groups and meditate and retreats. And it still doesn't work. It isn't there. What happened? Well, you may have a few more lifetimes to go. It's not a wife, one lifetime proposition. It's a many lifetime proposition. And you don't know how many years and lifetimes you've already been practicing. I think personally, when I look back on this life that I've lived, that I may have practiced before. Because when I went to the Zendo and heard Buddhism for the first time, it made perfect sense to me. I said, well, of course, it was practical. It was an analysis of the human condition. Of course. And when I went to Bible study, not that there's anything wrong with Bible study. <laughs> Seinfeld was one of my favorite shows. <laughs> I didn't understand a word. I was blaming the King James Version. But maybe it was just me. Maybe I couldn't hear it. And millions of others did. But when I heard Buddhism, I heard it. And maybe millions of others don't. And that's okay. We all have our own path. We all have our own stuff to work out. And what we can do, perhaps, is encourage each other to be the best, whatever it is, they can be. Because that's what works for them. I don't think everybody needs to be a Buddhist. It's too hard. <laughs> you know? We have no grace. We have no forgiveness. There's a, there's a certain level of accountability we're stuck with. Can't blame anybody else. Man, you know? <laughs> so I'm happy that the Buddha on Bodhi Day, December 8th, found his perfection. And it inspires me that maybe one day I'll find my perfection. And until then, I just have like a lot of practice to do. A lot of forgiveness for myself and a lot of not hope, but confidence in the future. That one day, the right conditions will arise and I'll realize at that point that I was already there. Happy holidays. <laughs>